everybody. Um, hope everybody is having a wonderful day and here for the Teal Talk. And I would like to, uh, I will start by introducing our, our two uh, hosts uh, that will be carrying us through here. And uh, as you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the, the chat and you'll also have a chance to ask questions as well. So um, if something pops into your head, put it in the chat uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. And we're going to be talking about uh, you know, self-care. So uh, first I'd like to introduce, I'll introduce Megan Thomas. Uh, she is uh, 27 years old um, from the uh, great state of Virginia. Uh, she has had scleroderma since 2013. Uh, she is passionate about uh, patient advocacy and scleroderma awareness, and she has a really cute dog. Uh, and then also our other, other host is uh, Dr. Janet Poole, who is a professor for the Occupational Therapy Graduate Program, School of Medicine, University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And she received her bachelor's degree in occupational therapy from Colorado State University, her master's in educational psychology from the University of North Carolina. And then she completed her doctorate, um, doctoral degree in motor learning, mo uh, motor control at University of Pittsburgh. Um, and another, some more information with Dr. Poole. Uh, her clinical interests and dedication to people who have scleroderma, scleroderma was fostered by rheumatologists at University of Pittsburgh uh, and people with scleroderma. She has designed hand and face exercise programs, developed self-management programs, and collaborated with people with scleroderma in finding solutions to challenges in performing daily tasks. Her research has focused on the changes in hand function and the impact of scleroderma on people's lives. So with, with, with that, I will hand you, hand you off to, to their capable hands. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thank you for the wonderful introduction there. And I gotta find my slides here. There we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Ron. And it's great to meet Megan. And it's an honor to be here today to talk to you all about gadgets and tools that hopefully will help you with performing daily tasks. And I know that many of you already use these or you may have ones that are very different that you use. And I always think it's a great opportunity to, to um, kind of share that information because there are certainly things that I don't know about that you all might know about. It looks like we lost the slides again. But don't worry, I always have a paper <laughs> version so I can always talk. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, um, gadgets and tools in occupational therapy, we call these with more fancy names like assistive devices or adapted equipment. But basically, they're items, equipment, or a system that are used to increase or improve the ability to do a task. Um, a lot of these tools also can reduce pressure and stress to the hands and fingers. And we're going to talk about low-tech and high-tech, mainly probably low-tech. And a lot of these tools can be used for performing activities of daily living, including self-care, um, home management, work activities. A lot of tools can be used to help protect you from the cold and with mobility. And just a reminder that using gadgets and tools often goes along with behavior and routine changes because you often have to remember to have these with you or to, to use them. Um, I made slides uh, because I don't have all the equipment that I can get pictures on from the internet. So I did that and then hopefully we can have a discussion. So I'm gonna first talk about gadgets for daily tasks. So these are for like things like dressing, maybe feeding, teeth care, um, holding utensils. So the ones there on the left-hand side of the screen are for dressing. Sometimes zippers are really small and it's hard to you know, pull them up. So using a piece of fabric like that, or even if you have a split ring and somebody that can help you put the split ring on, 
that can be easy. There are button hooks that are available. I actually have a button hook because we teach our students how to use these, but that can help with buttoning. The other thing is to not wear clothes that have to have a lot of buttons on them or to button them up, have somebody button them up ahead of time to almost just so you can get your kind of head through it and then you don't have to deal with that. On the picture in the middle, now there's slip-on shoes that actually look pretty good, I think, and are actually comfortable and supportive. And sometimes you may need a long shoehorn, like the picture of the person in the red shirt there, to help get them on if you can't reach down to your feet. And then also there's um, built-up utensils. You can put foam on something. In the old days when I started, we actually had those pink foam curlers. Some of you may remember that. We could use those to put the foam on, or you can even go to a store that has plumbing equipment, sometimes get um, tubes to do that. And then of course, teeth brushing is really often difficult to manipulate the toothbrush and the floss. So using all the electric appliances like flossers and, and toothbrushes can be helpful. Okay, next slide, please. Um, a lot of people have told me that you know, use, opening up things is very, very challenging, especially if one has hand involvement. So I've just a whole bunch, these are pictures that people have sent me or they've told me about. You know, the one with the mayonnaise, you know, it's mounted on the bottom of uh, like a shelf or a cupboard and they just put the object in there and then you can even use both hands to turn it. Um, sometimes those jars that you get, they have to pop the seal can be really, really hard. And, you know, a jar popper or the jar pop can help with that. The 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 can opener on the right is good because it's got a bigger handle that may be easier to do. And then the other two in the middle are different types of um, jar openers or poppers. I had one lady that I worked with that told me when she went to the store, she asked the when they were packing her sat bags for her, she asked them to pop the seal on things that, you know, like some jars that have that seal on it. So I thought that was an absolutely brilliant idea. And sometimes using, taking the small ones with you can be easier, you know, than hauling everything else around. Um, these are just the five and one helps with all different things like tabs, um, screw tops on bottles. I think there's even a part of it, you know, those pills that you get or that are in the blister pack, which are just really awful to get out no matter what you have or don't have with that. And one of the things I do when I can't get them out is I actually, when I get them, I have some pills I take, I just use scissors to actually cut slits in them. So then I have at least a chance of, of pulling it apart to be able to take it. Um, the Medigrip bottle opener can help with, you know, a lot of the medications or the push down and turn. You can request from the pharmacist a tab one, tab medication bottle or lid if you um, want, if that's easier for you to do. And then I feel like the OT and probably people with scleroderma's best friend is this material called Dysum. It usually, it can come in like a flat little thingy like this. You can get it on a roll and you can cut pieces of it and you can cut it small or big. And it is fabulous for gripping. Um, one lady that I talked to said that she had cut up little pieces of Dysum and put them in plastic bags and she had them everywhere in her purse, in her car, in her suitcases, and in the kitchen because she found it was so helpful with that. Um, I guess what I've used, if all else fails sometimes to open something, I've tried using a damp washcloth. Sometimes a washcloth might give the friction that you need, but to me, Dysum is, um, is my best friend and hopefully and many of you may also use that. Okay. Next slide. So um, the other thing is that as people, many of you may work, and even if you aren't working, you probably are doing some type of work, and we're all using the computers to either read or communicate with other people or even you know the, our phones too. So there are different things that can be used for work, and some of these start to get more into the, the high-tech area with that. So there are heated mouses and keyboards that you can use, especially if you have pretty severe Raynaud's with that. Um, some of these that are more costly, and there's also an ergonomic mouse if it's hard for you to hold on to a regular mouse because you may have hand contractures. A lot of you already figured this out already. 
Um, some of these, if they are expensive and you are still in the workforce, you can work with your HR department and your doctor to be able to request accommodations so that they will have to get those for you. Um, there is, of course, speech to text and there are ways of doing that. You know, I think a lot of us use that on our phone, but you can do it on your computer. And then sort of the low tech one is um, those wrist sleeves that you get or wrist cuffs, and you can insert the chemical heat packs in the wrist sleeve, and then that will help keep you warmer. Um, somebody whose name I saw on the call here actually um, had like a sleeve on her forearm and she put the warm packs in there and that actually helped transfer the heat down to her hand too. And then the one on the other side there is like a something to tilt your computer to help sort of with ergonomics if you do work or, or do anything on the computer for a long period of time and you don't have a work surface that you can uh, raise or lower too, too easily. Okay, and then protection from the cold. Many of you probably have Raynaud's and um, some of these are again more high tech and some of them are more low tech. And this is also where routine comes in and developing strategies uh, because you have to oftentimes have these with you or have a pack or a, you know, a bag or something that you put in the car if you go to, or even the grocery store because they're cold and especially in the freezer compartments. And so that's why it's really important to kind of have these and, and keep ahead and always, so you always have them with you. Um, there's chemical hand warmers and there's also, you know, feet warmer, toe warmers with that that are really great. Um, of course, avoiding cold temperatures. I'm um, being prepared, have the kit with you at all times, gloves, extra socks, hats, and then electric throws, flannel sheets can be helpful. They're not, a lot of us have this anyway. They're not really special gadgets, but I think I just wanted to throw that in. Um, and then there are rechargeable hand warmers that you can get and you just charge them and you put them in your hand and it can help warm up your hands, which is great. Um, one of my students had this vest on one day and I complimented her on the vest and she said, it's, it's a heated vest. I'm like, oh my gosh, can I have a picture of that? So she kindly said yes. And she had her husband take pictures and she showed me the battery pack there. So there's like vests, but there's also long sleeves um, that a lot of times people get too, and that can be really great. Um, and then there are also different gloves that you can, you know, charge heated gloves that you can charge the battery and will make it easier to do tasks. Now, sometimes when you have gloves on, then you can't really keyboard or, or things like that. But still, if you're going to an outdoor event or maybe in the store and you have to reach in uh, cold, cold places to get vegetables or frozen food, that could be really helpful with that. Those tend to be a little more costly. Okay. And then other things to help protect equipment, to help protect hands and fingertips and feet. We talked about the hand and um, toe warmers, insulated mugs, which probably all of you have, because I know that all of you are using a, a lot of these already and figured that out. There's a writer's glove that actually is supposed to be sensitive, so you can keyboard with them. I, I have not tried one. And then just, this is sort of a behavior one, but also that goes along with uh, gadgets. It's avoid type static grips where you hold your hands bent or like you're holding onto a handle of a suitcase or your purse or a, a bag at the grocery store because those really cut off your circulation. So using phone holders instead of holding the phone with your hand, wearing headphones, earbuds, putting foam on handles, so that wrapping foam around it so that it's not as much tension and pressure on your fingers and the blood vessels there. Using shoulder bags, backpacks, all those types of things so you're not gripping these things with your hands because if you grip really tightly, tightly that does cut off the circulation in your fingers. And then if you happen to use, be using vibrating tools, maybe in your job or what you do at home, um, pad those. And then uh, don't go barefoot for that. And then I have some heated socks. And they're all, you know, if you Google all this, you can find everything under the sun with that. And I think sometimes it can be very overwhelming. And many of you are, might be involved in support groups or other groups and can find out from other people what types of gadgets have worked really well for them or what ones haven't. 
And then last, I'm going to talk about mobility. Now, mobility actually means like walking or getting from place to place, but it also means like getting around and driving. So I happen to live in a pretty warm climate, but we do get cold and we do get snow because we're high elevation. But heated steering wheels and covers and seats are really great. Um, sometimes you, they are expensive, but again, you could always request that for a gift for the holidays and, and suggest everybody pitches in, uh, your whole family members or friends. I'm asking for accessible parking or covered parking so you don't come out and have to scrape off your car and there's a ton of snow on it. And then mobility devices. I put pictures there, but really physical therapists are the experts on prescribing and determining people's needs for mobility devices and can probably work with you or other people to secure funding for those. So it can be you know, pretty high tech, like some of the scooters that are out there or maybe a simple cane, or maybe the crutches that kind of fit on your on your forearm with that. And I think that is the end of my part. Would uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, Dr. Poole? I know we did receive a few in advance. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with those. So uh, one person sent in had questions about self-care for, for a preteen. So uh, an 11 year old boy is an example. Well, <laughs> I know I it's a, a wide question. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't know specifically what areas of self-care um, it could be whether, and I don't know if the person has hand involvement or what, but easy to put on clothes, you know, stretch, elastic, those types of things can be be good. Um, sometimes pullover, like coats or sweatshirts can be better than, uh, you know, like one that you have to zip up if you have difficulty with that. 11-year-olds are tending to want to look and do everything the same as their peers. So that can be hard too uh, with that. Um, and then thinking about what appliances like electric toothbrush, flossers, if those can be easy for the person. So I, I can't really give a lot more information because I don't really understand where the difficulty is. Long shoehorns, there's all sorts of equipment to help with dressing if people have trouble dressing. And I, and I think a lot of the things in your, uh, this was before uh, beforehand. So I think a lot of the things in your presentation kind of uh, 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 addressed a lot of those. Um, one of the other questions that I thought was interesting is, um, what would you say as far as exercise limitations for somebody with scleroderma? Well, again, my doc was really on gadgets and equipment, but um, that would be a whole nother talk, <laughs> I think, yeah. exercise and limitations. But a lot of people do can exercise. Um, again, you know, if they have severe pulmonary or lung involvement, they may want to get approval from a physician. And if it's really severe, they may want to be seen by a physical therapist or exercise physiologist or, or a cardiopulmonary program that can help them grade the exercise upward but being physically active setting goals for oneself setting goal achievable goals like i'm going to walk down to the next house and come back you know so that people actually do that thinking about time of day you know right now where a lot of you all live it's very very hot in the afternoon so thinking is it better in the morning um and then if they have, wherever they live, if they have access to things like pools or a gym or a senior center, or, you know, multi, what's multi, I can't think of the name of it, all age center, multi-generational type of center with that. So I think there's a lot, a lot that can be done. Yes. And any anybody online have any, uh, I know that some of the questions that come up, if they can get a copy of the slides and um and basically that it'll be on the YouTube channel uh, as far as the this this talk. So it will be available. Um, so but anybody else have any other questions? Um, 
uh, for uh, Dr. Poole. I see some person put in an auto electric can opener. Yeah, and I I think I have kind of a can opener, but all those are great. I mean, the electrical appliances are so much more available you know, now than they were probably when I started as an OT many, many years ago. Um, and then somebody I think I saw asked about where to get these. A lot of times you just Google stuff like, you know, hand rechargeable hand warmers or um, heated gloves, heated vests. Those types of things can give you probably way more information than you want. Yeah, that, and that's that I will say that's one of the one of the wonderful things nowadays that, yeah, as you said, it, it's so much easier to find things. Uh, and uh, and one of the things I, I like to share when talk about the the chemical hand warmers uh, that uh, I had somebody in one of my one of my groups uh, had uh, brought up that those chemical hand warmers can be reused if you put them in a Ziploc bag and take all the air out of them uh, out of the bag. Um, they if they're good for eight to ten hours you know, they're still going to be good for about that, maybe a little less. But if you're using them only for a couple hours at a time, you put them in a Ziploc bag and then you can use them the next day as long as you take all that air out of them, uh, out of the bag. So um, That's it's, excellent. yeah, it's one of the ways I, I know just for able to save a little money is helpful. So yeah, you had told me about that. I meant to put that in the talk and I did not. It's, so thank you so much for <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Um, yeah, because you had so much you have got so much information, um, which is fantastic. And um uh let's see, and yeah, so um between the uh uh you know, all the all the heated equipment, all the the adaptive devices. So uh, thank you so much. And I know I think we're going to, uh, we don't have any other other questions. So I think what we'll do, we'll transition over to Megan and uh, and we'll kind of go, go from there. Um, Megan, are you ready? I am. Uh, hey guys, my name is Megan Thomas and I'm very passionate about pet accessibility because I have seen firsthand the benefits that pets have on really everybody um, and myself especially. When I was first diagnosed with scleroderma, the only thing that helped me get through the rest of high school was having my dog. And so after that, it really became a big thing to me to sort of make sure that anybody who wants a pet can have a pet if possible. Um, and so I've had all kinds of different pets. I've had many, many dogs, but the important thing is I've had a pet, an emotional support animal, a therapy dog, and a service dog. And a lot of people tend to get those confused. And so for a second, I'll kind of touch on that. Um, first of all, before anybody asks any questions. So a pet is just exactly what you think. You go out, you get your animal, you bring it home, you're responsible for it. That's a pet. A therapy dog is a dog that has gone through training. They have a great temperament, a great demeanor, and they're trained to go comfort everybody else. You know, not just you. You take these dogs to hospitals, um, events, sometimes even, you know, medical facilities and high schools, you know, just to really help people reduce their stress and, you know, boost their mood. An emotional service animal sort of does that for just yourself. Um, they typically don't have training, but they really help with stress. Um, they can help people who have anxiety, who have anxiety about leaving the home. Pets can be very great for those. Um, and so an emotional support animal is very different from a therapy animal, just because your therapy animal is the one that has training and goes to other people. Your emotional support animal is more just for yourself. Now, a service dog is a dog that is trained to perform a specific task for somebody with a disability. And sometimes you can get doctors um, to write you a note to your insurance to help get it covered. That's difficult to do. And so my advice is to really sit down before you go to the doctor, 
write down all of the things that you have trouble dealing with. Write down the things that you believe that a service dog could help you with. Do some research and then bring those questions to your doctor. And a lot of the times, you know, if you have a great doctor, they're going to really work with you to figure out what to do to get a service animal paid for by insurance. So I think that that's a great idea. Now, the benefit of pets, whether it's a service animal, an emotional support animal, a therapy animal, is really, you know, they help alleviate loneliness. You know, I've noticed that a lot of people suffering from scleroderma um, tend to get very lonely. You know, a lot of the times we're stuck in the house. You know, the only time that we go is to a doctor's appointment. And so we also don't feel that we have people who really understand us. So having a pet can really help with that. And it's nice to have something that will just listen to you sometimes if you need to talk, but you don't want a response. You don't want advice. Um, even just, you know, petting your dog, it really helps lower stress. This has been proven for everybody, not just people with scleroderma. And, you know, I think one of the just amazing things about pets is they even lower your blood pressure because you're less stressed out, they lower your blood pressure. And this is, you know, dogs, cats, you know, maybe even your smaller animals like your bunny rabbits. And, you know, I think what's amazing is that they even lower heart attacks. And owning a cat specifically has been shown to cut a person's risk of stroke by one third. And I think that that's pretty amazing. Um, and I know my brother has a cat and she has just taken over his whole world and made a huge difference in his life. So I've also seen what cats can do, even though I have dogs. And so one thing that I would say, you know, we've talked about the benefits, but what's the flip side of that? Obviously, pets are expensive. They are a lot more expensive than you would think when you just look at it once you adopt them. You know, you have vet bills, depending on the breed of the dog, you've got grooming bills, you have to pay for their food, and it really adds up. I've got two dogs at home, they go to the groomer tomorrow, it's usually them combined, it's $140. Um, I've got to take them to the vet to get their booster shots. Who knows how much that's going to be. One of my favorite resources is called Furlanthropy. And it's run by this amazing man named Adam Spencer. He lives in the state of Virginia, not far away from me, actually. And so Philanthropy is a crowdfunded um, resource. It's a nonprofit. And the way that it works is, you know, you upload a picture of your pet, your story. You say, you know, what amount of money you need, why you need it. And you'll have donors on the website who can choose which person they choose to donate to. And the great thing about it is the money doesn't go to the person asking for it. It goes directly to their vet. And so those bills get paid off directly and it has helped so many people. Um, I saw the question say, what's it called again? It's called Furlanthropy. And also I will be sending all of this information to Ashley. Um, that she can post to make it easier. Another thing that I love that I actually use myself is called Care Credit. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard of it, but it's basically a credit card, but it is specifically for medical expenses. And sometimes it covers human expenses. Like I know that some dentist's office and some doctor's offices use Care Credit. But the cool thing is that you can actually use it at the vet. And is I forgot the exact number. I think it's uh, more than 25,000 vet offices accept care credit. And so it's more of a flexible way to pay for your bills. Um, so, you know, just like a credit card, you pay it down. But it really helps because so many vets, once they diagnose the problem that your pet is having, you have to pay up front. You know, you can't just walk out the door and, you know, say, you know, I'll pay this monthly. A lot of vets don't like to work out payment plans. And so I don't know about you guys, but most of us don't have an extra $2,000 sitting around when our pet hurts their foot. And so that's where I think care credit really comes in handy. Um, for an example, Miss Daisy, who I have sitting here, 
She's my emotional support pet. When we brought her home, I believe it was the second day that I had her home. She was in her playpen and she managed to climb up the gate, get to the top, fall back down, and she shattered her leg. And so, of course, she's so very tiny. We took her to the vet and they said, you know, her bones right now are the size of squirrel bones and we're not equipped to handle that. So you guys are going to have to go to Virginia Tech. It was thousands upon thousands, but the biggest one was the night we left the vet, we couldn't leave with our dog until we paid the $4,000 up front. And I believe at the time I was 21. Um, so I did not have that money. Luckily, I signed up for care credit actually while I was at the vet and that covered the entire purchase. So I was able to come home, pay it off um, in increments. So I really love care credit. Now, as far as tips for picking your pet, picking your service dog, anything like that, my tip that would probably surprise most people is to actually buy your dog from a shelter. Um, adopt a shelter dog if you're not specifically looking for a service dog, if you're just looking for a pet, a therapy animal, or an emotional support animal, go to your shelter. The reason I say this is because when we adopt puppies, we don't know what we're getting. Your dog can have the absolute best pedigree in the world and still you bring them home and their personality is nothing like what you wanted. And that's a really big issue if you've got scleroderma because the problem is when you have a disability like that, you can't adapt to fit your dog's needs. And it's also not fair on the dog when you have to adapt them so much to fit your needs. And so when you go to an animal shelter, you typically have staff who have been working with these animals. These animals are a little bit older. So you already know exactly what you're getting. And it's it's so tempting to just pick the first cute fluffy dog you see. Um, I'm guilty I've done that before, even when you know it's not the best choice. But really listen to the people who work there and have worked with these animals. And you can really talk to them and, you know, tell them about the things that you deal with and the things that you're going to need out of this animal. And they can help you. Maybe you need a calm animal that's just going to lay down with you all day and just, you know, do the bare minimum. They can help you find that, you know, even if you have to wait a little bit longer for them to bring in the right dog or if. You know, you want a dog that's going to help you get more exercise, be out and about, you know, something sturdier that you can lean on a little bit. They can help you find that. Or for me, you know, my little three pound dog, that's really easy for me to handle because I don't have a lot of strength. Um, my muscles have deteriorated over the years. And so if she's showing off, I can just snatch her up, whereas I can't do that with the big dog. So that's where I think it's very important to just go to a shelter. Now, if you're specifically getting a service dog, like my dog, Teddy, who passed away last year, that's where it's important to get it from a breeder. Ironically enough, I didn't get Teddy from a breeder, but those stories are few and far between. But you want to go specifically to a breeder who breeds service dogs, because then you can pick exactly what you need. The puppy already has the potential. You know that they can do the job. And so it makes a very big difference. Now, another tip that I have for pets, any type of pet that you have, is to hire a trainer. I know that it's a pain and it costs money up front. And a lot of people don't want to spend the extra money, but it will save you in the long run if you have something like scleroderma because you're going to teach your pet early on you know, maybe not to jump on you and scratch you, maybe not to nip at your fingers when they're playing so that you don't get ulcers, you know, not to jump up on the countertops, you know, to be something that you can handle. And I think it's very important early on to get that training. It will be worth all the money that you can think of. Um, I couldn't afford a trainer when I got my other dog, Kylo. And so I saved up a lot until I could do it and absolutely no regrets. He is a great dog for somebody with scleroderma. He's very gentle. Now, the other thing I would say is to find a friend or a family member, if you can, who doesn't mind helping you on your really bad days. 
if there's a day when, you know, you're having a really bad flare up, you're going into a flare up, if you can have somebody just take your pets for a little bit, even if it's just, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, just to give you a break and take care of them. I think that, you know, when you have scleroderma, it does take a village to take care of your pets. And so are there any other questions about that? Anyone, anyone? Um, and I, you know, that's one of the things I think there's, um, I think a lot of wonderful information. I know everybody's going to want, want all those, uh, the, the websites like for, for lamp, lampathy and, uh, um, you know, care credit and, uh, and those, those will be made available. Um, you know, it's, and, uh, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of, of pets actually right now I've got uh two right next to me on either chair uh my two cats and uh, uh one of the things that I also um uh echoing what Megan said I used to work for Humane Society for uh quite a while as as a uh, board member and when I went and was looking at getting a cat um it's so hard because you may see one and you say, okay, yeah, I want it because it's so adorable. But sometimes you have to go several times and try to find the one that that really talk to the people who work there, like Megan said, and and then also see when you interact how it how it is. Do you feel a connection? And that's that's something that sometimes it's it's um more challenging. One of the things too that somebody put in the chat that I thought was very, very good, uh, excellent idea. If you can't afford a pet, um, it, that one of the things that you can do is also look at, um, if you're up to it, to volunteer at an animal shelter. In uh, this way, you, you can get some of that interaction uh, without having to actually own the pet. So that's another, another option for you. So, um, Anybody else have any have any uh, <clears throat> uh, anyone else have any questions? I do, um, Megan. <laughs> so I, I loved your talk. I love the description of the different types of service animals. So I was thinking in terms <laughs> based on what I was talking about, in terms of like collars and leashes and that type of thing, if somebody has difficulty with hand involvement or strength, are there any ones that you have found easier to, you know, put on or take off or or just to handle? Now, Daisy is lovely and she looks like she's very well behaved, but you know what I mean? Um, anything to make that easier for you or how you got the scarf on, because I can't really see how it's, fat, you know, that type of thing. Oh, absolutely. Um, I have found that works best for me with my dogs is having a harness with a bigger buckle because they're a lot easier to press and open. And so the way that both of my dogs' harnesses are, you have a buckle, but there's also Velcro. And so you use the Velcro and then you can lightly put in the buckle. And on days when my hands are just killing me and I'm covered with ulcers, I don't even worry about the buckle. Now that's with, you know, my dogs who are trained, they're not going to bolt. Um, I know that you're not going to have that luxury probably if you've got a larger dog, but I always go for the biggest buckle that can possibly fit on my dogs without weighing them down. And then for leashes, I like to use um, a lightweight leash. What I will say is absolutely never use a retractable leash. Um, especially if you have scleroderma, that can lead to accidents and injuries um, for yourself. And it can lead to dropping the leash and losing your dog. So I love just regular um, nylon leashes. Find one that works best for you. But now they make leashes that wrap around the walker's waist. Or you can put it over your shoulders like a crossbody. And those are absolutely phenomenal for when your hands are just going through way too much to worry about hanging on to a leash. Oh, thanks. Those are wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Megan, does, Jay, uh, does Daisy have on her harness right now? No, she doesn't. She just oh, okay. has on her, um, her little scarf. 
Oh, she's so It's cute. actually the um, National Scleroderma Foundation bandanas that are for Yeah, sale. yes. That's precious. <laughs> Look at her. yes, Is she's, she... she's a sweet girl. And I, I go back to kind of what I said about really being patient and picking the perfect dog for you because, you know, I've seen what happens when you're just like, nope, this one's cute. I'm taking it home. And God bless him. I loved that dog so much, but um, Kobe was a lot to handle. There were a lot of injuries that were accidental that he wasn't trying to injure me, that he was just excited. Whereas Daisy, I waited about two years for her um, to become available and she's perfect. Um, she loves to go in purses. She goes to doctor's visits with me. And when she's home, she just lays down like this. Um, And she'll usually, she'll give me kisses. She warms up my hands when they're cold. That's something that she was specifically trained to do um, for the Ray nose. But she's just the most docile, sweet, gentle animal. Um, I never had to deal with her sort of nipping at my fingers during playtime. She doesn't do any scratching. And so it was a very long wait. Hi, sweetie. It was a very long wait to get Daisy, but it was absolutely worth it. <laughs> Um, Megan, one of the questions that, uh, that came in, um, was, uh, do you prefer emotional support or, or service animal or having both? For me, I actually prefer having a therapy animal because not, well, my dog Kylo, he's currently in training um, to be a therapy animal, but he's already wonderful. And what I love about him is that he's great for me. He's super friendly and sweet and loving to me, but I can also take him out to other people. And I always say, you know, let them borrow some of my happiness where, you know, he gets to go and really interact with other people, make other people laugh and smile. And to me, that's great if, you know, you really want to make friends or you want to be more social because I know with me, I always have medical appointments. And then I'm in the house because I usually, you know, I don't really feel good a lot. So I don't really get to go out and talk to people a lot unless it's a day that I'm bringing Kylo with all of the other therapy animals. And, you know, you really get to talk to people, interact with people. Whereas Daisy is a little more special to me because she's bonded only to me. But, you know, if I take her to a nursing home, you know, she'll sit there. they'll probably think that she's fake because she's not really going to go out of her way to please other people because she cares more about giving me that emotional support. Cool. Very cool. Um, let's see. Anybody else? Any any other any other questions? Um, I know somebody also mentioned, you know, also the options of fostering animals is is something too. Where uh, at the Humane Society where I worked, uh, usually there would be a lot of discussions about failed fosters where you would take it. You're just fostering, but then you end up keeping them. Um, so. So that's always that's always a risk when you foster that you may end up keeping keeping the pet. So which sometimes can be wonderful anyway. So, um, but yes, any other any other questions anybody um, that you may have thought of? And I'm not not seeing any any other questions popping up in the in the chat. Um, so I think, I think if, if anybody comes up with any questions, you're on your own. No, uh, <laughs> no, but, uh, but, but yes, this will be, this will be made available. It will be online. And, um, and I'm sure that, uh, if you do have any, any questions that come up afterwards to reach out, um, and, uh, I definitely want to want to thank uh, Dr. Poole and also uh, Megan Thomas for um, for their expertise and uh, sharing their time and their information and uh, making such a wonderful teal talk. So thank you very very much, um, and I think uh, we will. Uh, and I 
we've, I know we'll have more teal talks uh, coming up and you can find those on, on the uh, scleroderma website as well.